Sculpture is found all over ancient Egypt. It is found in temples. It is found in tombs. It is found in palaces. Uh, it was used as images uh, to portray images of the gods. It was used um, to commemorate the dead, uh, as is the case with this particular uh, sculpture. This is a sculpture of the pharaoh Khafre um, sitting on a throne. Uh, so first of all, let's just talk about the material. A mater this is made from a material called diorite, which is an incredibly strong material. It had to be imported from Mesopotamia. It is not local to Egypt. So once again, we see the use of materials here um, to denote wealth and power. Uh, this is not a kind of material that would have been available to everybody and would not have certainly been used in making artifacts related to common people. Um, and then we also see uh, the beyond the material, the way this image is sculpted. It is about life size. Uh, this would have been placed within Khafre's temple. Um, the Egyptian gods were viewed, or the Egyptian pharaohs were viewed as gods, and especially after their ascent into the the afterlife. Um, they were worshipped as gods. And in some of these more powerful pharaohs or some of the more popular pharaohs, uh, there was continued veneration for thousands of years. Their temples were open and active for thousands of years. They were l literally um, man gods. Uh, so we see Khafre here sitting enthroned both as pharaoh or king and as a god. Um, behind him on his head, you will see the god um, Horus. Uh, once again, this god associated with the, the pharaohs, the, um, the, living, the living Horus we have here, um, the pharaoh himself. And we have the protector god uh, kind of shielding with his wings. He literally has the Pharaoh's back shielding him as a protector god. Um, we have seen Horus already related to Pharaoh when we looked at the uh, palette of, of Narmer. Um, the, you'll notice that the sculpture is very tight. There is no negative space. There are no empty spaces. Uh, there's you know, a practical purpose for this. It would have been easier to carve and it would have um, wasted less material. However, the primary reason is to protect the integrity of the sculpture because this sculpture held something called the Ka. The Ka is the soul of the Pharaoh. The Egyptian concept of the soul is incredibly complex. Uh, there are five major aspects of the soul. There's the name, the heart, there's the ka itself, which is sort of the, our kind of contemporary concept of what a soul is, sort of a reflection of yourself. There's the ba, which is your personality, and then there's the shut, which is your shadow. Uh, these all have sort of different functions and had to be um, considered and prepared for in different ways during the, the whole burial process. But for our purposes, it's the Ka that we're focusing on because this is sort of the soul of the Pharaoh and this is uh, what needed to be protected because the soul without this statue would have been lost on its journey into the afterlife. This statue gives it a base to sort of return to. And this statue would have been treated as if it were a living person. The priest of the Pharaoh's temple would have bathed it, they would have offered it food, uh, they would have treated it like the Pharaoh himself. If we uh, look at the, uh, the, the Pharaoh's portrait, uh, we can see that he is wearing his ceremonial beard, uh, which is a symbol of his power. This was related to the god Osiris, who he will be reunited with in the afterlife. On the side of the um, throne, we see image, an image of the papyrus and the lotus, once again symbols of upper and, low, and lower Egypt, associated with the uh, Pharaoh's rule of all of Egypt. But what I want you to really pay attention to is how the pharaoh is depicted. He is flawless. He is perfect. He is young. He is eternal. Uh, 
Khafre, when this was created, was an old man. He certainly wasn't youthful and strong, but here he is shown as muscular. Um, it was important um, to show the Pharaoh as perfect, because first of all, he's godlike, but also this is his body for eternity. In fact, in, in general, Egyptian sculpture tends to show, um, to depict its subject matter as kind of eternal, uh, especially in the lack of emotion. These are funerary objects. These are objects of great reverence. These are objects that are meant to facilitate your journey into the afterlife. So, you know, showing an accurate portrait of somebody, showing somebody portraying re realistic emotions were not important to the sculptors here. Uh, what was important was to sort of, sort of sort of preserve the integrity of the pharaoh. In fact, sculptor itself means he who keeps alive. So the job here isn't to represent the pharaoh, but it is to house the soul of the pharaoh, the ka of the pharaoh. Um, these sculptures had very sort of strict rules and regulations. In fact, in general, Egyptian art had very strict rules and regulations. We've already talked about how uh, Egyptians were sort of obsessed with this idea of, of permanence. And you can see that by the fact that their art and architecture changed relatively um, hardly at all. Um, Th you know, throughout this almost 3,000 year period of Egyptian rule. And one way they did this was by using a grid. Now this grid could kind of change over time slightly, but for the most part this grid was, was based on a series of 18 vertical squares. And the aver and Egyptians were shown to be based on, on this proportion. Um, each square was the size of the hand. So, you know, no matter kind of what period we're in or where this sculpture or painting is, they're always going to follow the strict rule of proportions because the Egyptians wanted this kind of permanence. They wanted this sort of unchanging kind of quality. Because, you know, at the heart of it, the Egyptians believed that if, if things changed, if things were altered, uh, then that could, you could have dire consequences. The world could fall apart. So it was very important to maintain this consistency. And we have proof of this. We have images of Egyptian artists working. And in this case, we see um, a group of, of sculptors creating a statue. They would have started with a block of diorite, which they would have drawn a grid on the side of. And then they would have put a picture basically on all four sides, front, sides, and back uh, of the various views of the pharaoh. And then they would have sculpted from the outside in. And that's also one reason why these sculptures have this very sort of blocky appearance, because they're really made by just reducing this large block and sort of carving bits and pieces away until you kind of zoom in into the middle. So we are looking at two pairs of um, sculpture of, of couples. On the left, we have an image of Rahutep and Nofret uh, from their mastaba at a place called Maidam in Egypt. Um, this is painted limestone. Egyptians did paint, especially limestone. You don't often see that with um, some of the darker stones like diorite and the material on the right, which is called gray whack, um, because it doesn't hold the pigment as well. But with limestone and other kinds of porous materials that could absorb the paint, you, you certainly will see painted sculpture. Um, we have the, uh, what we saw in the Khafre statue, we have this sort of thousand yard stare, this kind of blank, unemotional uh, feeling of sort of this eternal permanence in the faces of the pharaoh. We see um, their hands over their heart. Um, the heart was um, central to Eg the Egyptian belief of the soul. That is where it resided, and that is it was preserved in the body, in the mummy. So we see this hand over the heart sort of symboling the importance, uh, symbolizing the importance of that.
Uh, on, let's look at the image on the right, though. Um, we see another royal portrait. We see uh, Mancare, who is uh, Khafre's son, and his wife. And uh, we see them in this very sort of rigid pose, which is typical of Egyptian uh, sculpture. We see uh, that sort of perfect youthful body and that perfect youthful face on both of the subjects here. And then we see this sort of typical Egyptian left foot forward. This is something that is depicted throughout ancient Egypt. Um, and it's, it's, it's really not understood completely why. It, it might have to do with the fact that the heart is on the left side and the heart is sort of the center of the soul. But otherwise, we don't really know. It's just this convention that was used throughout the history of ancient Egypt, and we see it over and over again. But it certainly gives this idea of this for your feeling of motion, this feeling of walking. Um, although it is completely unnatural, the, the left leg had to be made longer. It had to be extended uh, because the body is not leaning forward. The hips aren't thrusting forward because that would add sort of too much movement, too much livelihood, and that's what not Egyptian sculpture. That's what not Egyptian sculpture isn't about. That Egyptian sculpture is about preserving permanence, and so you don't want this kind of body flailing forward. So we have this very formal left foot out. I call it the Egyptian hokey pokey. But you had to make the leg longer to make that work. Uh, also, look at the 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 bilateral symmetry. Egyptian sculpture is divided almost equally in half. Once again, again, given this sort of feeling of kind of permanence of things that are unchanging, this idea of perfection also. So we have this sort of lack of emotion. We have this sort of youthful face. We have these strong bodies. We have this sort of perfectly balanced body. And we have this left foot thrusting forward. Now, what's fascinating to me about Egyptian sculpture, and the image on the right, you're going to see another video that goes into even more detail, but is once we move out of the pharaoh, images of the pharaoh, and we start looking at images of lower classes, and in this case, not much lower. We're looking at a scribe. And so this would have been a person belonging to the priest class. Both of these images would have been people belonging to the priest class. These are people who were incredibly powerful, incredibly learned. But they're not the pharaoh. And if we look at these images of these two scribes, we can see something very remarkable and very different. Their bodies are a lot more naturalistic. The image on the right especially, this scribe has sort of a typical middle-aged body. He has sort of a little bit of a belly, he has love and handles, he has sort of man boobs. <laughs> uh, and we are getting a much more lifelike, realistic, and naturalistic uh, appearance in this sculpture, which um, and the lower you go, sort of on the the the, the ranking of Egyptian hierarchy, uh, social hierarchy, the more naturalistic the image will be. And so, yet here's another example of another uh, scribe, and in both of these images, the image here of uh, Himenu and the scribe here, you see them actually doing their job uh, of writing sacred text. Um, this is, you know, not only, un this is not uncommon, not just for priests, but for really any class of people. Uh, in the afterlife, you often see them doing the things that they did in this life, because that would mean that you would continue that role of whatever it was you were in the next life. But so here we see, once again, this very naturalistic body, this belly, uh, this sort of middle-aged flab uh, that we would never, ever see on a pharaoh. However, the statue is still rigid, it is still strong, it still conveys a sense of power and permanence and perfection.